Uh, good afternoon. Uh, and uh, we're the uh, Carter G. Whitson Lyceum. And uh, I am Bernice Morris, uh, director of the Lyceum. And without delay, uh, I present Marshall University President Jerome Gilbert. Thank you, Bernice. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, let me first give you greetings and also welcome you to our campus, to Marshall University. If you're visiting from the outside and if you are part of the family, welcome to this uh, Lyceum. I want to thank you for being here to celebrate one of Huntington's greats, Carter G. Woodson. I also want to personally thank our guest speaker, Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander. Uh, Dr. Newby Alexander is the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at Norfolk State University. Uh, in a few minutes, Bernice will give her an introduction. I had the great pleasure last night of meeting uh, Dr. Newby Alexander uh, over dinner, and I can tell you that her lecture is going to be outstanding uh, today. But before I move on, I want to tell you a fun fact that I learned. Um, and that I discovered that our namesake, John Marshall, and my wife, Lee, and Dr. Newby Alexander all have something in common. So I'll let you guess what that is that they have in common. They all went to William and Mary, the College of William and Mary. So I thought that was fun to uh, think about that. Uh, we're also privileged to have with us today uh, Dr. Bill Smith and his wife, Vicki. Uh, Bill is a new member of our Board of Governors at Marshall. And I am so proud to have him on our board. He is already making a difference uh, at Marshall on our board, and I think he will continue to do that. I want to thank Bernice Morris, uh, the Carter G. Woodson Professor of Journalism and Mass Communications here at Marshall, as well as Dr. Montserrat Miller, uh, who is the Executive Director of the Drinko Academy and all the other individuals who have helped put this program together today. Many of you are aware that our marketing campaign at Marshall centers on the concept of family. The I am a son of or daughter of Marshall was conceived after months, months of research in talking about what makes the university unique. Many times we also use the phrase, we are, uh, and that indicates a connection. It also indicates a sense of belonging when we say we are Marshall. And I think both of those phrases really get at the heart of Marshall University. I do believe that Marshall is indeed a special place, and I, as president of Marshall, uh, pledge to always make sure that our university embodies an inclusive we, one that welcomes all students to campus and gives them respect and gives them opportunities, the opportunities that they deserve. We are, are proudly part of the Open to All campaign here at Marshall, where everyone is indeed welcome. We have great students here at Marshall. Uh, you know that we have many students of many different faiths here at Marshall, and all religions are welcome at Marshall. We also have students at Marshall that do not identify with any religion and who, in fact, call themselves secular students. And we have a group called the Secular Student Alliance, and I shared this the other day, that I was very impressed with the Secular Student Alliance last Friday when I stopped by their table and picked up a sticker that I want to share with you that expressed one of their core beliefs. And the sticker says, make racism wrong again. <laughs> and I think that is great. I would encourage everyone, I would encourage everyone at Marshall, particularly during Black History Month, the, to promote this message of making racism wrong. We are encouraging an open dialogue on our campus and civil discourse about things that threaten to divide us. We are challenging each other to be part of a solution. 
We do this through respecting and accepting one another, uh, much like an extended family. We are different, sometimes we disagree, but we all tie back to each other through our family bond. We are continuing to embrace our differences and celebrate our oneness. We make a beautiful family here at Marshall. So I'm grateful that we have this and many other opportunities during Black History Month, and I'm glad that we are here this evening uh, to learn about some things that we may not know about already from our guest speaker. So I want to thank all of you for joining us today, and I want to thank you more importantly for being part of our family. Thank you. Uh, today's speaker is the fourth uh, Carter G. Whitson lecturer in our series. Previously, our guest lecturers were Bishop Sam Moore in 2016, uh, Dr. Earl Lewis, president of the Andrew Mellon Foundation um, in 2017, and Dr. Carla Hayton, the Librarian of Congress in 2018. Our Woodson lecturer this afternoon is Cassandra Newby Alexander, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, uh, Professor of History, and Director of the Joseph Jenkins Roberts Center for African Diaspora Studies at Norfolk State University. Um, if we have time for Q&A, please ask her how a dean manages to do all these things. <laughs> uh, her book publications include Virginia Waterways and the Underground Railroad in 2017, and African American History of the Civil War in Hampton Roads, 2010, uh, co-author of Black America series Portsmouth in 2003, uh, Hampton Roads Remembering Our Schools uh, 2009, and co-edited voices from Within the Veil, African Americans and the Experience of Democracy in 2008. Uh, Dr. Nubi Alexander has published numerous articles and her upcoming articles include uh, The Search of the Twenty and Odd, Reclaiming the Humanity of America's First uh, Africans in the Virginia Colony, and Claude McKay's Banjo and the Harlem Renaissance. In addition to her scholarly activities, uh, Dr. Newby Alexander serves on the boards of the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation, the Virginia Law Foundation, the 2019 Commemoration Commission, the Historical Commission of the Supreme Court of Virginia, the Norfolk Cent uh, Sister City Association, and WHRO, a PBS affiliate. Uh, Dr. Newby Alexander has also appeared on a number of national programs, including the Library of Congress Kluge Center Symposium on 1619's Cultural Exchange, which was broadcast on C-SPAN in April 2018, which uh, is how I became aware of her, and I shared that video with several of you in, in the audience. Uh, Talk of the Nation in 1998, and Tavis Smiley Presents the State of Black Union uh, 2007, uh, Jamestown, the African-American imprint on America, broadcast on the History Channel. Other programs include the History Channel documentary on race, slavery, and the Civil War, and on C-SPAN, uh, when it filmed the uh, 2010 Virginia Sesquicentennial Conference uh, at Norfolk State University, uh, entitled Race, Slavery, and the Civil War, uh, the tough stuff of American history. Uh, Dr. Nubi Alexander has consulted for numerous agencies and initiatives, including the American Civil War Museum, Casemate Museum of Fort Monroe, the Hampton Histo History Museum, the Portsmouth Museums, Obsidian Productions LLC for the Motown Museum, and the Underground Railroad Educational and Cultural Program. She has also consulted with the Virginia Historical Society Jamestown Settlement Museum, Dr. Martin Luther King Memorial Commission, Virginia Humanities, Historic Jamestown, and the uh, 2019 uh, Commemoration Committee. Uh, let me add, too, that Dr. Newby Alexander is a life member of the Association for the Study of uh, African American Life and History, the or organization that Whitson founded in 1915. 
uh, the uh, Woodson Lyceum is an institutional member of, of that organization. Uh, several of us got to know Dr. Newby Alexander uh, at her welcoming dinner last night that uh, uh, Dr. Gilbert mentioned. And I think I can speak for uh, all of our guests uh, when I state that she now has fans at Marshall. And you will now see why. I present uh, Cassandra Newby Alexander. Thank you so much for that gracious, very gracious introduction. And I want to apologize in advance. I am having an allergy attack. And so if you hear sniffling, sneezing, coughing, whatever, please excuse me. I entitled my presentation, America's Promise. I struggle actually with what to name it. Because I think it's so apropos, especially as we're looking back in 2019, 400 years. You know, for, for so long, we've kind of jumped over 1619. We focused on 1607, which was when the Jamestown settlement was founded. But it really wasn't until 1619 that the Virginia colony was really going to be here to stay. And there were a lot of things that happened at that point in time. So what must it have, what must it have been like for the first Africans to touch the soil of Virginia, especially knowing that their futures were uncertain and their freedom was unlikely? What did they think after they were distributed throughout the colony that was sparsely populated with primarily English men and surrounded by a large and hostile Indian populace with many different nation states. How long did it take for this first generation of Africans in the nation's first colony to comprehend English and to adjust to their new environment? How many married and had families? How did the lives of the early Africans help to shape the economy and define the culture of America? Did they dream of returning home? How many lived long enough to be free? And how is the story of the African Americans important in understanding what we call America's promise? As Anne Brigham in her 2015 book um, explained, entitled American Narratives, quote, the freedom to go anywhere and become anyone has profoundly shaped our national psyche, end quote. In America, the idea of mobility both, quote, promises and threatens to incorporate the outsider and to blur boundaries. For Africans, the mobility of transport to America and the movement from slavery to freedom threatened the white status quo and blurred the promise of mobility as leaders promoted the idea of their otherness. Yet, acclaimed writer Ralph Ellison raised the important question in his 1970 Time Magazine article that asked the question, what would America be like without African Americans. Beginning in 1619, the arrival of the, quote, 20 and odd Negroes aboard the English ship White Lion, people of African descent became a permanent cultural and political fixture in the American colonies and in the nation. For the first century, the vast majority of the Africans coming to Virginia were from West Central Africa subjected to a kind of forced acculturation that accompanied their enslavement, Africans adapted over time. This, however, does not imply that they divested themselves of their African culture. Instead, they infused the, their culture into what we would see as evolving customs with music, art, religious, culinary practices, trading systems, agricultural and architectural techniques, and a language that created in America a Creole society. And that became the foundation of American culture. And just as an aside, 
You know, historians recently have been picking on Thomas Jefferson, you know, for about the past 40 years. And I remember as a junior high school student getting uh, a present, Fawn Brody's book on Thomas Jefferson. So yes, I am strange, you know. <laughs> um, and one of the things that, that they have brought out is that when you look at the plans, the architectural plans that Thomas Jefferson had, as he was building and rebuilding Monticello and all the other buildings, one of the things that architects have said is these are not architectural plans. They're drawings. So who did the architectural plans? The people who built and rebuilt over and over again Monticello. And those people were people of African descent who were enslaved at Monticello. So American history illustrates that despite efforts to achieve freedom and liberty through the law, English colonists used Africans more broadly, and blackness in particular as a marker, a symbol of limits, a metaphor for the outsider. Many whites could look at the social position of blacks and feel that color formed an easy and reliable gauge for determining to what extent one was or was not American. And we do not need to look too far in recent events to know that is still something that is ongoing. Thus, the arrival of the Africans in the American colonies really represented a sea change in the evolution of American culture. Those who arrived in the Chesapeake first in Virginia beginning in 1619 is really critical to understanding why did we begin to have a political, legal foundation in our society that immediately differentiated people of African descent from everyone else? So let's take a moment to discuss how these early Africans were forcibly brought to England's first North American colony. Now, we're familiar with the term human trafficking. But historians are now using that as they talk about slavery. Because it wasn't just about enslaving somebody and making them work. Human trafficking also includes sexual exploitation, which was a very important component in the slave trade. And so human trafficking and bondage long has been a part of global societies. At the time the Portuguese first arrived off the coast of Guinea, as early as 1441, the Trans-Saharan or Islamic slave trade was already a thriving commercial enterprise, transporting, and this is what people don't know, millions of people to the Islamic worlds that included North Africa as well as the Arabian Peninsula. The Portuguese eventually sought trading partners in West Central Africa, but the prosperity that ensued from the transatlantic slave trade and the abundance of gold led many subsequent Europeans to compete in very violent ways in some cases. During the 15th century, the Mabundu, who lived in the area we know today as Angola, had several kingdoms. The kingdom of Ndongo emerged as one of the most powerful. But as the Ndongo kingdom began losing power in the 16th century, the Kimbundu-speaking kingdoms established commercial ties with the Portuguese. Now I'm mentioning these names because these were the people who arrived here in 1619. And for the next 60 to 80 years, those were the people who arrived in Virginia, in Massachusetts, in the Carolinas, in Maryland, and other places as they were being established along the eastern seaboard. Now, in return for these commercial ties, the Portuguese were allowed to establish a trade station at the port called Luanda for direct trade not only with the Ndongo but also the Matamba kingdoms. Now, for those of you who are old enough like me to remember all the Tarzan movies, yeah. these names may sound familiar to you because these names entered into 
our cultural stereotypic psyche about people of African descent and about the continent of Africa. And if you remember, unfortunately, a lot of young people have no idea what you're talking about. If you, you, know, if you talk about Tarzan, they will say to you, what, huh? These are the Gen Zs, so fortunately, they have no idea. Uh, and that is one genre that needs to disappear to some degree. But um, all of them really were focused on that area of uh, that we call West Central Africa and the languages and the sounds of the names. And so the sounds of the names coming from those areas would be used to not only stereotype blacks, but to stereotype them in the worst, most inhumane ways. And so there's a reason why it happened because these were the early Africans who arrived. And they were part of this group who were, would be arriving in America for the first almost 100 years. So, <clears throat> excuse me, so what, what would happen? Of course, I lost my place as I was running my mouth. So um, as trade relations grew, the Portuguese exerted growing influence in the Nodongo courts that led to an increase in the site trade. The Kasanya Kingdom emerged as part of the Mabundu faction that became a staging base for slave and gold trade caravans going into the interior of the continent. When Queen Nzinga of the Ndongo rose to power, she expanded the kingdom by taking Matamba in 1620. Now, just an aside, and you know that Linda Haywood has published a book on Queen Nzinga, and the Portuguese absolutely hated this woman. They called her a whore and every other name because she was a woman and she was a threat. And she kicked their butts every time they tried to invade her territory. But what is also interesting is that she had clear, clear lines of who's supposed to be doing what. She had a court system that really lets you know that these were not people who had disorganized political systems. <coughs> and it'll be important for you to understand that a little bit later. So a series of wars between Nodongo and the Portuguese ensued, and Nodongo prevailed um, until Queen Nzinga died. Afterwards, the Portuguese were able to make significant inroads into that region dominating the trade and the people. And the Jamestown Settlement Museum actually has a display talking about, and Tim Reed actually organized that, along with his wife Daphne Reed, um, on Queen Nzinga and this whole uh, episode uh, in these early years. At the same time, shifts in power occurred excuse me, that shifts in power occurred in West Central Africa, a similar thing was taking place in Europe. During the Thirty Years' War in Europe, England and the Netherlands attempted to undermine Spain's encroachment throughout Europe and the Americas with attacks on their ships via privateers. Queen of England, for example, was very involved in sending people like Sir Walter Raleigh out to attack ships on her behalf. And essentially, they were they, we call them privateers, organized pirates, essentially. And so many of these individuals would be armed with commissions. These are special government documents that they call marks. And so people like Sir Francis Drake and Walter Raleigh were very successful in frequent attacks against these Spanish and Portuguese ships. And the English developed, at that particular time, special ships. They were smaller, they were lighter, more maneuverable, so it would be like a, a bee attacking you. And eventually, that bee is going to hurt you if you're not able to protect yourself. And that's what they were counting on. Now, a year after all of this, the Dutch leader, William of Orange, issued a letter of mark to a Calvinist minister turned privateer by the name of John Colin Jolp. What's interesting is he piloted the White Lion, an English ship, and nobody knows yet who really owned that ship. 
There are some investigations going on as we're trying to go through the papers. You know, when you're doing something illegal, you don't want to leave clues. You don't want to tell people, yes, this is what I did, this is why I did it, and let me draw you a line between what I did and me. Nobody's going to do that. So the records are kind of all over the place. Now, this particular ship had both English and Dutch crew aboard the ship. And of course, they were designed to do maximum damage to any Portuguese ships wherever they were found. But they would usually go to Mexico, to the Veracruz port, because that's where one of the main two ports that the Portuguese had and the Spanish had. As the Portuguese were delivering, or sometimes the Spanish were delivering their cargo of human beings to those ports for distribution in the transatlantic slave trade. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, uh, at the same time, we had Jope get um, an issue of Mark from William of Orange. The Duke of Savoy, who was part of a very complicated anti-Spanish alliance that contested the Thirty Years' War, issued a similar mark to another man by the name of Daniel Elfrith. He was the captain of the ship, the treasurer, that was also owned by the Virginia Company of London. And John Thornton in his book, Central Africans Atlantic Creoles, said, quote, among the many items of wealth that English and Dutch privateers sought from Spanish shipping were slaves. Initially in the early phase of the war, they had captured slaves from Portuguese ships bound from Africa to the Spanish colonies in, the Ameri in America and sold them to the Spanish colonists whose demand for enslaved workers were being denied by the managers of the tightly controlled slave trade. Why? Because they didn't want privateers honing in on their business. They wanted to control it totally. Now what's interesting is that a year later in 1619, the Portuguese governor, who was based in Luanda, his name was Luis Mendes de Vascoles, excuse me, Vasconcelos. He enlisted a group of ruthless slave trading mercenaries called the Imbagali. Now, the Imbagali used religion as a weapon. They struck fear in the hearts of people by doing certain things to people they attacked, making people afraid of them that somehow they were doing things to people's spirit. This was terrorism. And we see evidence of that today in, with a lot of different groups. And so he enlisted these people to fight against the Ndongo Kingdom and to start going in and raiding a lot of these towns and cities. The result was that he had them capture over 60,000 people during the three years that he was governor. And one group of 300 people, 350 people actually, that he uh, brought in from one of those raids were placed aboard a ship called the San Juan Bautista. Now this ship crossed the Atlantic in 1619. It was longer than usual because of the weather patterns and mortality was very high aboard that ship. So the master of the ship decided to offload some of the enslaved people who were seriously ill in Jamaica and let the remaining group continue on to Veracruz. Historian Elgin Souter documented that after 100 Africans died within the first 30 days after they arrived, and, and then of course they arrived in Jamaica, and where they sold about 24 young boys because they were so ill, that, that they then made way to the town of Campeche in the Yucatan. And it was there that the two English ships, the White Lion and the Treasurer, attacked the San Juan Bautista, and they took about 60 of their human cargo off the ship, allowed the ship to continue on after that, with about 29 going to the, the treasurer and 30 plus being on, on board the White Lion. 
Now, the weather separated the two ships. So the White Lion arrived in late August of 1619 to Old Point Comfort. How many of you have been to Fort Monroe in Virginia? One person. All right, how many of you have been to Virginia? <laughs> Let's start there. How, how many? <laughs> How many of you have been to my region of Hampton Roads that includes the cities of Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Chesapeake? Okay. So they call it the Hampton Roads because there's a waterway that separates one part of the continent from the peninsula. And you really can't travel anywhere in Hampton Roads without going over a bridge or through a tunnel. We are at and below sea level in most of Hampton Roads. The waterways have traditionally been used as the main point of transportation by native peoples and the English simply followed their model. But unlike the native peoples, English people were not accustomed to this riverboat trading. The ones who were, were the Africans who were later brought in. And so, the, the Hampton Roads is where all the waterways come together. It's a very deep port. It's why the Norfolk Naval Station is placed where, where it is. It's the largest naval base in the world. That's why the Port of Virginia was placed where it is in Norfolk and Portsmouth, because the waterway, where all the, the rivers, the James, the York, the Nazma, the Rappahannock, all these rivers pour out into this piece of waterway and then go into the mouth, it's at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay, which then seven miles away is the opening to the Atlantic Ocean. Very treacherous waterway, it's about 300 feet deep. So you have huge cargo ships that can come and go. It is the best natural port area along the eastern seaboard in America. And it's there that the English set up essentially two places. One, what we call Fort Monroe today, they call Old Point Comfort. That was a little area where they would receive the ships that weren't English ships. And then if you go up the James, which was about 15 miles, uh, that's where you would encounter uh, the Jamestown settlement, but also the city right next to it, or the little town right next to it called New Jamestown. And if you have a chance, visit historic Jamestown because it's there that you will see the archaeological work that they're doing on that site, a site that for the most part has not changed in 400 years. And so it's there at Point Comfort that the first group arrives. All 20 of the people who were offloaded were traded for supplies and distributed to the leadership in the colony. When the treasure arrived three or four days later, Captain Elfrith discovered that the Duke of Savoy had signed a new treaty, so his mark had expired. But what made it worse was that Governor Samuel Argyle, who had arranged this, he was one of the um, uh, investors in the Virginia Company, which was based in Bermuda, so he was involved in this piracy. Um, he had uh, some conflicts. He was losing power. Um, his master, the Earl of Warwick, uh, was losing power in England. And so he hightailed it out of Virginia because they were going to hang him. The new governor coming in was gunning for him. So he left, fled to Bermuda, and then they engaged in a cover-up with their records saying that the treasurer, while it came to Virginia, nobody left the ship. They just came and then left. And sometime later, the following year, they came back. No, historians are finding that they actually lied in the records. And one of the secretaries in the Farrar papers actually said, and you know, we really didn't do this, dot, 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 dot. And, they, and so historians are now looking back at those records. That's why I like to tell my students, history is still alive. We're still discovering new things, even something as far back as 400 years. We're still finding that the story is far more complicated than what you thought. 
So eventually, the situation with the treasurer ballooned into a major scandal, and it resulted in the dissolution of the Virginia Company. So a lot of people are thinking, oh, well, the Virginia Company just decided they weren't going to continue anymore. No, they dissolved over the scandal. Efforts to minimize or cover up their piratical activity and, involve, and the involvement of their owners and investors really then helped to obscure the historical record that we're now trying to piece together. We do know that a little town, and, and it was called by the Kikatan Indians, they called their town Kikatan. Today is called Hampton. And so at that site, that's where we believe there were maybe 10 or 15 Africans who were offloaded at that point, and they became a part of this first generation of Africans who were here. In fact, the people today say that two of those individuals that they believe came off the treasurer um, were Isabel and Antony. And Isabel and Antony were in the records as having the first documented child named William. In fact, their child was named after their owner, Captain William Tucker. And what's interesting is Captain William Tucker became that child's godfather. So legally, that child was not enslaved because you cannot, according to English law, be recognized as being a Christian, and you are recognized, if you can get baptized, you're recognized as being a Christian. So for whatever reason, this man put in the records that he was this child's godfather. And the descendants still, the Tucker family still exists today and are trying to gather more and more documents about their family. Now, of course, as I indicated, the majority of these people <coughs> excuse me, who were from the kingdom of Ndongo, it is believed that they came from a heavily populated region near the Lukala and the, Lu, excuse me, the Luteti rivers near the capital of Kambasa. Many of these people then had an urban background. And when they uh, were captured, many of them were already practicing Christians. Now, of course, what we would see in the records is they practice a syncretic religion in the same way that Europeans practice a syncretic religion, where they superimposed Christianity onto their native religious practices. And that's what many of them did. Once they arrived in Virginia, we would see the recordings of a number of these people all on plantations up and down the James River. Why the James River, aside from it being near Jamestown? In Norfolk or in Hampton, the water table is very high. And so you're not going to be able to produce tobacco there. And you were, tobacco production was already going on. John Rolfe had already developed a tobacco product that was selling like gangbusters in England back in 1616. So the plantations along the James River and then the next century, the York Rivers, would be the primary places where you would see Africans concentrated, not in small numbers, but in large numbers. Even though their numbers were still small, but they were concentrated in those areas. So the Africans who appeared in the records, most we don't know names of these individuals, but they're mentioned, some of these people are mentioned later on because there are no records for at least 20 years of any new Africans arriving in Virginia. So we're starting to see um, a natural increase among those who were there. One person in particular that was mentioned in the records was named Angelo. Now, I, I had to do a little research, and I found that in Portuguese, Angelo can be male or female. And she was a female. And, and we see her name listed in the 1624-25 muster records that said at that point that of all the Africans that were arriving in 1619, two years later, 
21, were living in colonized areas. So what were some of the areas? The Flower Dew 100 plantation, and these, if you go, if you're going down uh, I-64, they're all along that area from Williamsburg all the way to Newport News. That's where a lot of these plantations were located. We know that she was in the town of New Jamestown, and that's an area that essentially hasn't changed in 400 years. There were, other, there were about four other people mentioned by name. Anthony, there are a lot of Anthonys. There were two Anthonys that were mentioned by name, Williams and a John. Little information, though, has been uncovered about these early people who formed the early communities of Africans in the Virginia colony. But what little we know, we're hopeful, we'll find more. For example, Angelo or Angela was listed as the property of Captain William Pierce. Now, Pierce was a wealthy and influential planter and a merchant who arrived in the Jamestown colony in 1610. He was regarded as a beloved friend of Governor Francis Wyatt. He was the colony's Cape merchant and sometimes served as the lieutenant governor. He was also the commander of the Jamestown Island. He was responsible for maintaining blockhouses where they were keeping some of the food and munitions. And eventually, he built a house right there in New Jamestown by 1624. Now, it's important to know that Captain Pierce and John Rolfe, you all know John Rolfe and Pocahontas, uh, they both ventured to Old Point Comfort in 1619 in August with the arrival of the first Africans aboard the White Lion. Pierce's daughter, by the way, would later marry John Rolfe after he was widowed, after Pocahontas died. By 1625, Pierce's household was listed in the records as including this woman, Angelo, who they said arrived aboard the treasurer. So that's the only name we have as a person who arrived aboard that. Now, since 2016, Historic Jamestown has made efforts to uncover the world of Angela slash Angelo. Archaeologists have identified where Captain William Pierce's household was located. They found the footing of the household, <coughs> and they've also found three graves on that site at the same level as it would have been in that period of the 1620s or 30s. I'm hopeful because the Park Service will not open up the graves. I'm hopeful that the community will demand that those graves be opened up in the hope that Angela is one of those three people. And if you visit the site, you can see the graves. You see the outline of the graves. Another Angolan who was forcefully brought into the colony was named Edward. He was identified as living at this place called Necoland with owner Richard Kingsmill. So if you go to Williamsburg and you see the Kingsmill uh, plantation and resort is named after him. Four also lived on the Bennett plantation, Peter, Anthony, Francis, and Margaret. Two lived in Elizabeth City, and I mentioned them, Anthony and Isabella. And many of these officials owned about, there were about 18 to 19 plantations, as I said, along the James River between this period of 1619 and 1620. And when the census was taken in 1620, there were 892 Europeans living in the colony at the time, with men outnumbering women seven to one, which is why there was a call made to bring white women who were unmarried to, to uh, the Jamestown colony because they were afraid that these white men were having sex with, white, with the Indian women and they didn't want this kind of environment. They wanted a white community. And so there were a number of women who would arrive the following year. Some of them, though, interestingly, did not get married. <coughs> I don't know what that was all about. 
Now, at the time that you had 892 Europeans by 16, in 1620, there were 32 Africans who were documented to be living in the colony. What's interesting is there were 17 women and 15 men. So they actually had more women than the Europeans. <clears throat> Four years later, their numbers would increase to 183. Where they were coming from, we don't know. How many were the result of natural reproduction? We don't know. These are some of the unknowns that I'm hopeful as people go back into these old records that survive that we'll find more information. There was a man by the name of William Harmon who was brought to the Virginia colony and enslaved in 1662 to a man named William Kendall in Northampton County. In Northampton County, Accomack County, that's all on the eastern shore. Six years later, Harmon was freed and was listed in the records as raising cattle on the eastern shore with land. Harmon's wife's name was actually listed in the records, and that was unusual. Her name was Jane Gossel. We had another person, Francis Payne. He was enslaved by a man named William Eltonhead in 1643. By 1656, he was listed as a free man with a wife and children and owning land in a place called Cherry Stone Creek, also on the Eastern Shore. He was initially recorded as the property of one person, so whether or not there was a shift, we don't know because so many records were lost over time. It's unclear exactly when some of these people became free. Some records we have, others we don't. But we know that some of these individuals secured a lot of land. One of those people was Anthony Johnson, whose wife Mary owned a plantation that they would later name Angola on the eastern shore. Now these individuals mentioned by name along with their families are known because they became free. However, the majority remained unnamed and probably never gained their freedom. They lived throughout the colony concentrated like their European servant counterparts on large plantations in James City County. Near the end of the 17th century, the African ethnic makeup began to diversify along with the expansion of the colony. So instead of having people from Angola, maybe the Congo, the Cameroons, we would see a shift northward on the west, in what we call West Africa. So we're talking about Guinea, Senegambia, um, Nigeria, these are more names today, Nigeria, Togo, Benin, we would see that shift. And so we would see a variation of the ethnicities entering into this. What is clear is that the Angolans brought with them a culture that was clearly intact when they crossed the ocean and encountered Europe these, these Europeans, because they already were familiar with the Portuguese. So these, coming primarily from England, were new to them. And so how long it took them to understand English, we don't know. But it seemed to have happened pretty quickly. Um, we know that within the lifespan of many of these individuals, racism and the actual institution of slavery evolved. Now, there's a big debate among historians. Were these people enslaved? Were they indentured servants? Well, no, they weren't indentured servants. Because an indenture is, some, is a contract you actually enter into. So there's no way they were indentured servants. But there was no law in place in the Virginia colony establishing slavery. In fact, we wouldn't see a law established until the 1680s. The closest thing was the 1661 law that said all incoming Africans would be enslaved. We know that there were multiple freedom suits. So the Africans coming in knew church law because they were arguing that they were Christians and therefore could not be enslaved. But the English courts were saying that only English people or Europeans can be Christians. That blackness 
that by being black, they could not possibly be a Christian because only Christians were white. So we would see that evolve in this particular time period. <coughs> in the 17th century, North American records suggest that Africans maintained a lot of their traditional beliefs because the English did not invest much effort or time in converting them. Why should they? That would mean they would be free, so they didn't want to do that. So the English colonies continued in Virginia to be in a tremendous state in, of flux. Now, let me just say, the first colony that established a slave system was Massachusetts in the 1640s. So you had Africans being brought both to Virginia, to Massachusetts, as well as to Maryland and the Carolinas in these early years. By the 18th century, we would see approximately 84,000 Africans in the colony of Virginia. The majority by that time came from what we call the Bight of Biafra. And this is where you had a domination of the Igbo, the Mandi, the Fulba, and the Akan. And you see those groups anywhere from Ghana to Nigeria with a concentration from Togo and Benin. This um, um, constant infusion of Africans at this time meant that a lot of the sacred practices became a part of our society. So you would see a lot of the English actually being influenced by a lot of these cultural practices. Even though the English were the power brokers, the Africans adapted their labor forms to this, and foods to this new environment. They being the, the uh, enslaved people of the prominent individuals, they were in total control over food production over the building of houses and forts and so forth, and eventually in the trading, uh, the, the water trade. And so we would see, for example, in the construction of houses, we had the Virginia house. Now, you know, the English had houses that had little rooms everywhere, and that's to hold the heat in. You do not want to hold the heat in anywhere on the continent of Africa, and if you've been to Virginia in the summer, especially in Hampton Roads, or actually anywhere, and, and that includes here too, you do not want to hold heat in. You want to have something that's like a shotgun house, where the airflow can go very easily in and out, and you surround your house with trees. So we would see a lot of that kind of architectural structure emerge. Now, some of the native peoples already had houses similar to that. But we would see very quickly, within about 30 years, um, the, the houses begin more to resemble houses in that West Central African area in Virginia. We would also see Native American foods such as corn, squash, pumpkins, and beans integrated into the English diet. But these foods also intersected with the English foods of pigs, cattle, sheep, wheat, flour, carrots, onions, and a variety of greens and beans. But then we, and we would also see sweet potatoes and white potatoes introduced from, of course, where? Anybody know? Not from Idaho. South America. South America, exactly. So when the Africans came in, what came with them? Peanuts, which is actually from Central America, or actually South America. And they got that through the Portuguese trade. Black-eyed peas, okra, yams, Watermelon, excuse me, <coughs> watermelons, sesame seeds, cassava, cola nuts, and lima beans. And because, of course, these were the individuals working in the households, responsible for the cooking duties, we would begin to see the emergence of Southern cuisine. Not African American cuisine, Southern cuisine even though some southern whites appropriated 
these recipes and called it Southern cuisine, it was actually African and African American cuisine. It was a true blending of a lot of different food groups, but one thing that you would see, and that is, you know, in, in anywhere in Africa, north, south, east, or west, there is no such thing as eating something singular. You do not have a piece of meat, and the, you know, like the French, piece of meat as, as your first dish, uh, vegetables as your second, that does not exist on the continent of Africa. You always have some sort of grain that forms the foundation, some sort of grain that might be a, like a grit, how many grits, but you know, but that was new to the Africans. That's what the native peoples use, but that was new. So that was an adaptation that they made. But the greens and a little bit of meat, and you ate it all together along with the juice, the juice that had all of the important vitamins and ingredients. We would begin to see Europeans, in particular the English, starting to eat in a very different way, especially in these areas where we had Africans as enslaved people. In fact, historian Donna Gabaccia said that it was Africans' slaves' central posi position as producers and processors and, and cooks of food that allowed them to leave an indelible mark. It was the West Central and West Africans who laid them the foundation of what we call Southern cuisine. What are some of the things we would see? Hot spices. In fact, it's always amazing to me when I meet a Southerner who cannot stand spicy food. I always ask them, where are you from again? How is it that you don't like something spicy? That's why anywhere from North Carolina southward, on the table of any restaurant, will be an important ingredient, you all know, hot sauce. And, and depending on where you are, you might have five different hot sauces with different variations of spice in them. Uh, we would see fried okra and rice and black-eyed peas and used in a slow, I know I'm making you hungry, used in a slow cooking way, producing what we call gumbo. In fact, gumbo is very much a dish that comes from Nigeria. Almost the same, they call it okra stew. And real gumbo always has okra because it, it um, makes the juice congeal to some degree and makes it very hearty. So culinary historian Jessica Harris said that our food traditions really provide us with a historical roadmap for American society because the foods we eat hold symbols and meaning. It connects us with our ethnic origins and with our shared Creole past. America's colonial cookbooks reflected this creolization while removing the idea of where these recipes came from. And, but as, as a scholar Alicia Cromwell actually noted, she said, then what we ought to do is study the silences. Where was it not mentioned? And that's where we find really where some of this cultural input was there, and it was there in, hu in a huge way. So this year, 2019, we're commemorating the arrival of the first Africans to English North America. An important event is happening at Norfolk State University. I'd like to invite you to participate either physically or online. It will be live streamed. It is called 1619, The Making of America. It's something that we've been doing since 2012. And we took a long time to come up with that title because we believe that what happened in 1619 really began to make America. The summit explores four themes that are integral to our understanding of 1619. And even playwright August Wilson included a character in his plays that embodied the wisdom and legacy of African Americans. He named her Aunt Esther. 
and she was a character born in 1619. So these themes that we're going to be looking at include reimagining representations of people of color, America na America's narrative reframed, citizenship and the law, and finding America's roots. Over the course of 400 years, people of African descent experienced continual and inheritable bondage, family separation, in some cases torture, segregation, legal abuse, economic exploitation, and even murder. Yet, they endured and became agents of their eventual liberation. Whether it was through fighting in all of America's wars, through the Underground Railroad, through the court system, on the streets protesting for equal treatment, in the halls of Congress, and even in the White House. Indeed, this is a story about black agency that helped America even define its understanding and definition of freedom and equality. This is the story which has inspired others in their quest for freedom and equality, and it has become a defining characteristic in America's narrative of his promise. So I conclude with the title of Ralph Ellison's article, What Would America Be Like Without African Americans? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this has been really interesting, and I think we've all learned a great deal. So I will not speak for very long, because I want us to have a chance to converse with you informally and to continue um, this really interesting and important exchange. I just wanted to say a couple of words. Um, the President's reference to family as the basis of Marshall's distinctive identity it's more than a metaphorical um, expression. Families, as we know well, aren't just a matter of genetics. Um, they're made through will and through love and through commitment, and that really does define the Marshall community here, and it's very important to us. And as such, by joining us as uh, here on our beautiful campus to offer the, the fourth um, Dr. Carter G. Woodson um, lecture, that means that you're now a friend of the family, uh, and we hope that you, we'll see you again here on our campus, um, and that we'll continue to exchange ideas with you and to explore this really important uh, subject from these uh, interesting angles that you have offered us. So uh, beyond the fact that now we're friends of the family all together here, I wanted to also recognize the fact that we share a bond of citizenship. Um, we come from two polities, Virginia and West Virginia, but from one nation. Uh, and even more importantly, I would assert that we are citizens in a transnational polity that some scholars and others refer to as the Republic of Learning. And because of your great citizenship in the Republic of Learning, on behalf of the Drinko Academy at Marshall University, I'd like to present you with this um, award to commemorate your speech today. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. It's just been an honor. Thank you. And so with that, shall we conclude the formal portion of the program, and I hope that you'll enjoy the um, food and the drink that we have available to you and continue to converse with one another and with our guest speaker. Thank you so much, Bernice, for a great job in organizing this. <laughs>